Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the weekly Kubert meeting. Uh, I'm your host, Chris Caligari, and uh, we hold this meeting to uh, discuss issues uh, relating to the Kubert project. Uh, I'm going to share my screen so we can all see the meeting notes. And I'll put the link into chat. Okay, link is in chat. If you'd like to follow along, go ahead. Uh, otherwise, just uh, watch the screen. Um, first item is uh, we usually fill in our, uh, our names uh, under the attendees. Um, if you could do that, uh, I'd appreciate it. We always like to see who is attending. And we have um, some agenda items. So how about we wait, uh, we'll wait one minute for, for everybody to fill in their agenda items. And while we're waiting, um, let's see, do we have anybody new with us this week that would like to say hello? Looking at our attendees, and I see familiar names. So nobody knew. Then uh, let's proceed into the agenda. David Vossel has the first item. Go ahead, David. Hey. Okay. Uh, so I want to gain uh, more deep insights into our Qvert controllers. Uh, so since so we're profiling and the, the kinds of things that I'm looking for aren't, uh, they're kind of custom things. They aren't things that you would typically necessarily think about with the normal like CPU or memory profile here. So I'm thinking about, um, I want to understand, for example, like what keys are popped for what controllers within Vert controller and how often, uh, perhaps even how long uh, the execution uh, takes for those keys. Um, I'm thinking about uh, what APIs are called to the, the uh, Kubernetes API server. So are we um, calling a bunch of Git requests in our Vert controller for some reason? And if so, I, I'd like to see why. Um, and then just kind of the typical things of uh, like where we spend the most time. So that, that would be the normal CPU and memory profiling, uh, just to determine like a heat map and things like that. So I'm looking at this and I'm curious if anyone else has thought about this yet uh, and has any ideas on how they would want to uh, have a workflow for this, uh, if that makes sense. Anyway. So that's the topic. Uh, does anyone have any thoughts? Uh, because I've already sent an email outlines uh, some of my thoughts, but go ahead. Hello, hello, can you hear me? I can. Loud and clear. <laughs> Just didn't know if I was talking to myself. I apologize. Uh, I was wondering, are we talking about just hooks or are we talking about um, something that's built into the, into the system that we enable or disable at runtime? Like, I'm thinking there about something just... that's enabled and disabled at runtime. So it would be something that's kind of in the background um, that kind of uh, is tied into uh, all of our controllers and how we do requests. Like I, I was looking, like I've, I've done some investigation. We can wrap, I can wrap our round trip, like HTTP round trip um, logic in a way where I can see what's going out and what's coming in. And I can trace that if I want. So. I could have these wrappers and everything and then just have some dynamically flip on, all right, let's start actually profiling this when we want it. Uh, same thing when I was thinking about like work queues and stuff like that, I could wrap the work queue and then begin understanding uh, what keys are popped and how often. And again, have that as something that we're tracing dynamically if we want it or don't want it. Uh, so it wouldn't be necessarily a performance penalty uh, just to have it all wrapped. Uh, but uh, it would be performance penalty once we actually decide to start profiling. Cool. And so by keys pop. So one thing that came to mind when I read your initial email was how often we see in our logs where a uh, an update couldn't occur because it was wrong resource version, blah, blah, blah. And it re exactly. It. Yes, yes, that's exactly what I want to know. How often these collisions occur and things like that. 
Perfect. So my thoughts on this are that um, a lot of such things are already collected with Prometheus. Um, uh, and from a previous experience where I used Hystrix a lot, um, what I always liked is less using such generic wide ranging profiler options like CPU profiling and memory profiling and instead having explicit measurement points where which are which are interpretable for a wider audience and if you use something like Prometheus or Hystrix to these endpoints you very often do not even have to disable it even because the runtime overhead is pretty low that's my no, normally my channel approach to this so like defining first what, what's an interesting question to ask guys like the collisions then checking is there already a metric there for that or can we interpret it for, uh, can we distill it from the collected metrics already and then add some something like this if it gets too chatty something like a debug level or something may make sense to not always collect them one of the things i was concerned about just in general with the idea of exporting these metrics with Prometheus is I wasn't convinced they provide the um, fidelity that I was looking for. So uh, I can understand if you're wanting to monitor something from an operations perspective and gain some insight into how it's performing, Prometheus is pretty great over a long period of time. Uh, but let's say, for example, I wanted to start a profiler, I wanted to run a very specific uh, set of tests, uh, and then I wanted to stop the profile, and I wanted to export uh, exactly what occurred over that time frame. How would I do that with Prometheus? Well, you have a time range. Um, I mean, it, it depends on what exactly you you try to count. If, well, yeah, yeah so of course, things which you can't. But there's only like you're talking about the fidelity that uh, you're only getting the maximum amount of fidelity that Prometheus scrapes at. So let's say it scrapes every minute, or every thirty seconds, or something like that. You're not you're not going to get so yeah. You're not going to yeah, get something yeah, in a very mean. tight yeah. time frame. So so I mean, you get specific points there, but it's of course, I mean, the collection inside the binary is more granular normally, but yes. Um, so so. I, I see the value in Prometheus and something kind of long-term. And I even said this in the email there, maybe exporting a set of metrics, maybe just a subset, depending on, on how detailed this debug information is. I don't see that as being a replacement for what I'm looking for though, or at least it's not obvious to well, me. Um, yeah, for, for me, the thing is normally that there you get a lot of things and, um, if you try to debug specific scenarios, I personally found it more interesting to to locally try to reproduce it, like with tests, unit tests, or so on. And uh, for the other part, it's more like how many collisions are happening and so on. Uh, I think that Prometheus is normally good enough, but I'm not against adding such profiler things. I just just from my experience, it's very valuable if, if you have really clear measurement points, which can be compared. I, yeah, I, I think the Prometheus stuff is, is very helpful. We should work more on that, but the profiling information we get from Go and that's easily enabled. Like I saw Ryan's question, if it can, if it has to restart, you can enable the profiling on the flying Go. Um, that gives a quite different picture of the inner working of the process to optimize like which function uses how many much memory and stuff and i i really would love to see that because i've i've enabled it by hand and removed the code again a few times and it's it would be easier to get it this way it, maybe there's like a few here like there's some um, like to me what i'm hearing is like we have like roman mentioned some we can report in metrics. I, I'm, and then David talks a little bit about the profiling. I'm, I'm even thinking some other stuff. Um, like we could, like you, what about like transitioning time phases and like, you know, how, how do we track that as well? Like all kind of other questions that we can, we can learn. And like the, and I could see them existing kind of in different places. And like, it sounds like there's maybe a home for each of these 
like that there's probably a few that we could that make sense in prometheus but then like if we're doing profiling like just for like functions and code and and if we want to use like maybe we can define those because like a subset of these i think makes a lot of sense in profiling and then i think a handful of them make sense in prometheus and then maybe somewhere maybe some of them exist should exist on the object like the one i mentioned like when an yeah. object changes uh, phase, like we don't know when that happens. There's no trans last transition time. Like that's another one that I'd want to know. Yeah, approaches are definitely not mutually exclusive. It's just hey. um, I, for the profiling, I really just see some very corner case debugging cases more. I mean, except if you only have that, then you would, you would try to use profiling for everything. Um, but for the things which Ryan, for instance, mentioned and stuff like collisions, uh, how many REST calls we do and all this stuff, I would prefer to see that in Prometheus more because it's easier to see there from and interpret from my perspective, I feel. But I don't know. The differentiation I, I took so far is I use Prometheus metrics to measure um, over a longer frame of time anomalies, like to see if, if I run a low test on, like I did with the SSH endpoint, if I end up with more go routines in the end, or if I had resource leakages, or how performance happens in, a, in an actual test. And I use profiling for looking into a specific case. I want to see more details on why this happens, or I want to exactly. inspect where the memory goes in a function. Exactly. So, and that's why, why, for instance, would want to see more well defined measurement points first with Prometheus, because it's, I see it as the broader useful thing. But I mean, if the, the profiling stuff is done in parallel, why not? Yeah. How about this as a path forward? Um, I think the metrics collecting, whether it goes to a profiler or Prometheus or whatever, uh, I don't think it's mutually excuse, exclusive for how it's presented. So for example, if I'm interested in seeing how many times the queue is popped for a specific key or something like this, I think creating these um, tracing packages that allow us to gain these insights is kind of the first step, perhaps. And then there can be multiple ways of exporting that. Uh, it can be exported through uh, you know, some sort of profiling data. It could be exported as a Prometheus metric or, or whatever. Maybe that's kind of like kind of separate. Would that make, does that make sense to approach it like that? Oh, where are you talking about a, a specific, like? Specific profiling data because I thought you were just talking about the Go memory and CPU profiling that gives you endpoints that you can query from the Go process itself. Because that's completely separate things than adding custom metrics. Talking about both. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah. So there, yeah, that would be part of it as well, enabling okay. the, the the Go profiling. Um, I guess I would I would consider this like a debug. Uh, profile package of some sort that allows you to enable different tracing, whether that be uh, profile and CPU memory, I consider that kind of part of this, uh, maybe some other custom tracing that we want with inside our controllers are very specific to what we do uh, and anything else um, that you might not want enabled all the time because of a, perhaps a performance hit or something like that. Yeah, I mean, uh, having more fine-grained uh, metrics even, if you, which you may not always want to collect. That's also easy to do anyway. Um, it's not clear to me what you mean with, so that, that you enable the memory and CPU profiler somehow and disable it somehow, I guess that's out of question, something useful. For the measurement points, I'm, I'm not so sure if we need something else than Prometheus right now, uh, because I really think the most important part is getting a, getting the, the pictures regarding the person tools and so on, and less about debugging individual cases, at least from my point of view. So what I'm thinking about is, again, these really tight time frames of if I want to run a CI test, for example, and uh, I want to Let's say we come up with some sort of minimal stress test. I don't know, launch a 10 VMs. So, so maybe, maybe just one question for upfront. So it's not like, I mean, Prometheus just scrapes every, scrapes every five seconds or 10 seconds or every second, whatever you configure it. But that doesn't mean that the metrics which are collecting are missing 
data. It's like you still get uh, accurate percentiles and accurate counters and everything. Maybe if you add the red labels, you also get the granularity per key and everything. I mean, you, so for instance, you can run a end-to-end -end test which runs 100 VMs and deletes them in five seconds and you still can collect all the data if you just scrape every minute for the test. Yeah, but it's the aggregate data of the entire runtime, not when I wanted to start profiling versus, I mean, I guess I would have to do some sort of calculation if we're saying that, but then I don't know when. What I mean is you just need to, you need to know the start time and the end time of the test. Right, and that has to coincide with when Prometheus exactly scraped it and what uh, so when we're talking about tight time frames and actually trying to measure something that we well, you, you just have to ensure that you don't do anything afterwards so so if it just takes one second and you scrape all 10 seconds you would choose a fr frame of i don't know wait 10 seconds first run the test the, the workload wait 10 seconds afterwards and then you have the metrics within that time frame which are for that test that's how i normally do stuff like this for instance that could work. Hey, David, is this work going to be in collaboration? I mean, you can, of course, use pushing. You can, of course, use some kind of pushing or whatever to collect it to. If you like. yeah. This Prometheus doesn't do push, does it? Or is that a pattern? Yeah, I know. Oh, I, it's it like just means you have to introduce another collection framework then or expose it somehow differently then. And something that could solve a few of those topics that we, I think, mentioned a while ago would be adding tracing to our uh, our operators. Adding what? I didn't understand. Tracing. tracing. Distributed tracing. Mm -hmm. And we can utilize them wherever we want more details. So Jaeger or something? Yeah, something like Jaeger or like, yeah, open tracing. What what does that enable? Uh, it you can you can in a function you want to know more about the performance or anything you can add a, a, sp a trace span and those get exported on a node and you can look at the um, whole trace of the process in like That's a Jaeger UI. Okay. And I guess you can and I think you can define what it, yeah, I mean, you can define programmatically in your code if you want to do too, to get exactly that stuff. Yeah. It may, it may be what we're looking for, yeah. Okay, I've spent some time with tracing and I've become more and more a fan of it, but I don't know if you can replace it. Like, it, it works for a specific, like it's only as fine granular as you make it compared to a like go to go tracing if you do pproc, but it's still more than uh, before. And it can also output valuable data that we can get from CI and stuff. Like it's it's it, it's complementary to metrics. So right now our CI does not deploy a Prometheus stack by default. Uh, we can of course yeah. enable something like that. We have the PR open. It's it should be. So. Oh, we, we are. So this is something that we're considering uh, enabling for all CI providers. So it's, uh, I'm not sure yet if we want to end it, add it for all end-to-end -end tests, but uh, what's right now planned is at least to enable it in the periodic tests, which run every day and collect the data there and uh, have a specific test lane, which runs scale tests, like starting 100 VMs and so on and collecting the data for that. Pretty much what, what, uh, what I explained before. I see. Okay, so that would give us a baseline understanding of uh, at least the performance metrics that we export today, which is not a whole lot really. Um, I'm not even sure what we would be measuring yeah, so uh, you can get you get API calls and all this kind of stuff. Um, Only but, from but the dead. perspective of the Kubernetes API server, like you're not but, seeing what comes. Uh, from there is more like the there. We, we, there are some controller metrics which we are export which, which we export and so on. And we don't enable yet everything which we inherit with the API machinery packages for our components. But I would expect so after we have that, the scale tests get in, and then we define 
the measurement points which we want in our controllers and expose them to. Hey, David, I have a question uh, from a community perspective um, and collaboration perspective. Do you plan on uh, reaching out to NVIDIA and collaborating on them with them for this kind of work? Uh, sure, Ryan, do you want to collaborate? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I saw their email that uh, came from NVIDIA this past week, and it, it seems like they have an, uh, a deep interest in in uh, collecting performance metrics. Yeah, I think that's the use case, trying to understand what your team is doing, Ryan, and then figuring out how we improve the measurability of all this. Yeah, like uh, from from our perspective, like we want to we want to increase as much visibility as possible, and you know, having and one of the things that from that milling thread that Fan was looking at was just having a tool to to measure um, things, and and I even mentioned one of the one of them earlier, like um, you know, like we've been looking at it from the perspective of phases and the way things have been moving through phases and, and BMIs. We, the some other stuff we've looked at is profiling, but profiling, but it was very. Um, uh, we we haven't had, we haven't really published it. So this is awesome because this actually is a, a really nice way that we can enable it on the fly or um, even expose it in, in, in a more general sense. So definitely, yeah, I'd like to collaborate on on even in this specifically as well as the other stuff with measuring. Okay, sounds good. Um, maybe you guys can uh, take this over to the, the performance SIG as well and, uh, and talk about it. Sure, and, that and makes sense. Uh, just one more point. Well, oh, go ahead. You go ahead. No, no, yeah, okay. No, uh, just one point I also made an email. I, uh, I'm not sure, I, I haven't read about anything else having done this with the sub resource yet, but I really like the idea of maybe talking to the community or getting a, a standard practice around this, that we have a tool that is pos able to tell different controllers, different sub resources, hey, trace now, and is able to collect that. It could be something not only Kubert could use. Um, that's the, the idea of triggering on a sub resource. Sounds pretty cool and something other people could use as well. When I was uh, talking with or looking at what Ryan's team is doing, I think one of the things that led me to the path of using a sub resource and, and trying to gather stuff on a very tight, I, I like the idea from a developer standpoint of being able to know exactly when the profile start, exactly when it ended, and have it all exported just to a file that I can view. And that's, that's one of the things I'm kind of attached to right now. And the reason for that yeah. is when we're viewing things, say Prometheus metrics or however we're, we're gauging um performance maybe from a long-term stress test or whatever like that if i'm wanting to uh begin um trying to understand how to improve efficiency of controllers and things like that i like being able to run very tight tests and see what changed in a very like controlled manner and being able to see that in like file output and things like that uh, Maybe that's just the way I visualize things and the way like I visualize my workflow working for this as a developer. Uh, so that's why I've been a little bit, I guess, open to the idea at Prometheus, but then at the same time, kind of like that feels like a burden to me to have to require Prometheus, use Prometheus to, to gather all these things when so really from a developer perspective, the, the, I just the, want to the Prometheus stuff will definitely come if you want to use it for the case. I, I don't think that it, anything speaks against allowing any Windy profilers. I think it's not mutually exclusive. So, okay. um, and I mean, like with, it's pretty normal, like, um, as I said, I've been using Hystrix and other stuff like this in the past, and it's pretty normal to also have measurement points in the code, which help you with performance measurement in general, you can't go down to a tracing level, but this is normally fine. Because from my experience, 
you normally need to find out, oh, there's a difference in, I don't know, from, from going, going from phase A to phase B, if you run the test, there's a huge delay, which is unexpected. You see that in these metrics pretty easily. And then it's normally just a matter of looking at the code and having it in a few minutes, from my experience at least. Okay, hold on. Someone's writing a lawnmower. Oh, that's me. I'm back on my lawn. <laughs> Same time. Just being productive over here. <laughs> no multitasking during the meeting, David. <laughs> it's my it's my neighbor. Uh, but I, I think I'm done. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I'll prototype something uh, that kind of have my vision, and we'll we'll see more discussion from there. Yeah, I, I just shared open telemetry. I, I don't know if you, that's a uh, post project of mix of open sense and open tracing. I don't remember it's a CNCF project. Maybe there is that there should be some stuff in that helps with what you're trying to achieve. If it's a tracing of metrics, it, it includes both. Maybe that's that's a standardized way we can fall back on for what we want to do that the community might benefit from as well. Alrighty. Good discussion. I'll I'll do some more research. Thanks. Thanks, David. Okay, uh, moving right along uh, to Ashley and uh, Bert CTL command. Okay, yeah. So um, sometimes, or some bugs have come up where VMs get stuck in a terminating state waiting for, for their termination grace period um, to finalize. So for Windows VMs, that's you know an hour. Um, so we're where I was looking into some kind of escape hatch. So if the user doesn't want to wait that termination grace period, that was specified a way to uh, get rid of the VM doing a vert CTL destroy or maybe a vert CTL uh, stop dash dash force, um, which would just instantly terminate the VM versus waiting for that graceful shutdown. Um, I was kind of curious if that is something that would be a desirable feature or if we specifically don't have that for a reason. I think, I think it's, it's desirable. Yeah, yeah, sounds good to me. Same here. Okay. Um, and is there, I was kind of leaning towards adding an extra command for TTL destroy, uh, just because that kind of lines up more with the vert, uh, the libvert um, commands. And also in doing that, we would need to add some kind of status, uh, some kind of new object to the status of a VM to know that we are terminating without waiting for that graceful period. Um, That's a good question. Yeah. In Kubernetes, it works a little bit different, right? You can use the dash dash force and just this grace period to shorten the grace period. Yeah. I would have expected this more, but I don't know. Yeah. The one just one thing like Kubernetes just deletes the API object, but it doesn't necessarily kill the pod, and we might want to kill the VM inside instead. Yeah, so if, if you give it a grace period of, uh, of one or so, it's just one, it's not deleting it. If you do add force to it, it deletes it, right? Yeah, but yeah, no, the, yeah, it does, but only the API object, as far as I know, Kubernetes yeah. does not delete the container necessarily. I wonder if we can just update this uh, um, graceful period. Yeah, we, we could. Um, could we just add a dash dash grace period equals one or zero or whatever? In a vert CTL stop or? Yeah. OK. I don't would know. We... Actually, I'm so, I don't know if that would work. That, that expectation with the grace period that we have today is also uh, attached to the pod. Uh, I don't know. It gets kind of complicated. So we set a grace so period. On the pod, you can update it. You can do with the rest. Uh, you would do another delete call and specify different grace period. The question is, we have some changes on our minds regarding to not deleting the pod anymore when you delete the VMI, right? That may conflict somehow. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, at the end, if we add a force or 
destroy at the end it has to kind of deal with uh, the part where we have the grace period so you would have anywhere even if no matter if you have explicitly specified grace period on the command line or if we have a destroy command at the end we have to fiddle around with the grace period and the pod deletion at the end to really get rid of it at some point, I guess. But the Otherwise, reason the pod, the the reason the pod is stuck in that grace period is because the VM isn't terminating. So this would just force the VM to terminate versus waiting for it to stop. Okay. I guess. So you would not touch the the pod grace period. Yeah. In that sense. Yeah, that and that was the plan. We are adding it up, but. It would then be still be so it could then be that okay so you would stop the for instance the v windows shutdown or force stop exactly it, but it yeah. could still take for another infra issue still until the grace period is over because there is with the pod deletion issue or whatever but that would be then something different yeah that would be a separate issue okay yeah then i destroy maybe okay i don't know so I think the question is uh, destroy versus force. I, force seems more consistent with the Kubernetes API today. What does destroy mean again on like libvirt with versh? Does that mean we're actually, yeah. Just, yeah, destroys the domain. And undefines it, like it, it's a total removal of it. I can't remember. Yeah, from my understanding, it is. Okay. What What's the situation now if you force and grace period here the a pod with a stuck or running VM, um, and it gets removed from Kubernetes, but the container is stuck running? Uh, do we, does it block anything on Vert Handler, or like, do we have any way of getting rid of the container running in the back? Uh, so we're tend to see, see the connection and we'll try to terminate it. Okay. And I guess the well, it tries to do the same. So, but you of course have this period until this is somehow resorted, yeah. uh, that you could end up with that, that data access races or something and corrupt disks or data. Okay. So. I would therefore not go, yeah, dash dash force is really just with dash for, as Kevin said, you're really deleting the API object so that it's really deleted no matter if the container still exists. So I'm not sure if we have this in mind with this force here. So I, maybe we should not use dash dash force here to not confuse it. Well, I, so with destroy, and I, I think the point that I was about to make was if we're Using destroy because it's consistent with libvert. Libvert undefines the domain, I think. Therefore, we're we're just wanting to stop the virtual machine, not like delete the actual virtual machine object as a result of destroy. Yeah. So it's not like the dash dash force from Kubernetes, right? Where you we would more like want to kill for libvert actually <laughs> deletes the domain, though. I think. Let me double check that. Yeah, but you don't have, but, but you don't, yeah, I, I mean, the domain doesn't have time to shut down. It just is immediately stopped. But um, the difference is that there is no, there are no data races or anything. So Libert succeeds in destroying or not, and but afterwards, you know, it's down. Whereas with dash dash force on kubectl dash dash force delete the pod, the API object is gone, but the pod may still run. Sure, but do you get do you get the inconsistency of what I'm trying to say with Vert CTL destroy? Yeah, I think what if I understand you correctly, you you mean like we would need not destroy but something like kill because we don't want to delete the VM, just kill it. Right, exactly. So yeah, so destroy versus the right destroy is definitely wrong. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so versh like the libvert client destroy is going to delete the domain. It's gone. Vert CTL destroy, if we're trying to follow the same pattern as libvert, wouldn't be doing the same thing. It would just be force stopping the virtual machine. So yeah, a vert CTL kill uh, VM might be more accurate, I think. Or a vert CTL stop with dash dash grace period. 
Maybe we can just make it work on VMI, not on VM. It will be clear what are we killing. We've confused that topic a little bit. So the start and the stop works in the say, VM. If we would really say we to the stop, my VM dash dash grace period equals zero or one or whatever, I think it would be pretty clear. I just define that within the grace period, it should go down. There, there Can is I no yeah. motion that we take the kind of the minutiae offline. I think we all agree this something needs to be done, but I don't know if we need to decide the complete solution right here. Yeah, I was going to give this discussion about another minute. <laughs> I think that the grace period thing is the thing that we could probably all arrive at and agree on if it doesn't cause any problems with uh, the pod grace period or anything like that. Like if somebody can't, if they try to set that to a higher period than uh, the pod, I don't know. Like we talked about yeah, updating that's, the pod. It's normally something which is just validated. You see it on the pod, you just validated. Something like this might be worthwhile taking a poll on and just seeing who wins. Yeah, I, I would be because <laughs> I'm an old NetApp guy, and I I love destroying at, uh, NetApp aggregates, disk aggregates. So <laughs> I lean to the destroy command. <laughs> so what would be your um, expected outcome of the destroy? Does the VM still exist? It's just in a no. state. All trace of it is gone. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's what I would expect from destroy, but that's not what we're necessarily talking yeah. about here. Yeah, let's uh let's come up with some kind of poll and uh take it to the mailing list so we're not uh just going around in circles here. Um yeah, Paul or Ashley, did did you want to just start a mailing list thread and maybe we can just sort it yeah. out okay yeah that that's sounds great. good i can write up something sounds great it's Thanks. definitely Thanks. the type of thing that someone two years down the line says how come this argument is named like this and so it's definitely worthwhile making it right okay uh ryan you have the next uh item vmi create diagram yeah so the uh last thursday uh, in the six scale meeting um we spent the time building a diagram uh that will show what happens when you create a vmi so all the different um steps that occur there's references to code functions everything um so and, and kind of the goal for this is so that we can kind of level set we can all get to a point where when we're talking about you know different areas of the code and where we think there are bottlenecks we can at least refer to a diagram so we can have an easier time communicating about the different areas that um uh that we think are, are bottlenecks so and it's also good just to reference in general because of uh i think the process from end to end knowing and getting it all down in your head is uh, can be hard to visualize it in, at one time so uh, it has a bunch of different uses. So I um, we put that together. I put it on the Kubert Dev Slack channel. It's also on the mailing list. And I created a pull request to add it to the docs um, repo, which I linked in there. So um, if folks can check that out too, that'd be great. Nice. This is really awesome. Uh, this really helps David uh, when he's uh, does his code walkthrough with a community member. Right, David. I can just look at this, and then <laughs> can walk through themselves. I'm a little nervous <laughs> about, about uh, doing any sort of presentation with that because it just um, gets out of date almost immediately. Yeah, I know. I, I could see like over time, like we, especially because we we have function calls, we have code reference. I think like I, I tried to make it at least somewhat general with notes, so that we have an idea of like okay, what's happening during the transitions and stuff. But yeah, at least for at least for now, it'll be precise, and we can always uh, can always consider updating it or um, you know what we end up what it's longer term. But at least for now, it's a good conversation point. 
Yeah, I think it's a good visual for conversation for sure. So if we're talking about something, we have something tangible that we can all look at and agree at what we're talking about, which is always <laughs> helpful, especially working remote. What did you build this with? Can we move that into a collaborative document? Like, uh, I don't know, uh, what, what Lucid chart or? or... I used uh, draw.io. It's uh, the link is in the six scale document. It's it's shared with okay. Hubert Dev. Um, I can also put it in here if you want to see. Uh, of course, we have it in the notes. Yeah, I, I don't draw. Yeah, let's do that, please. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Pretty cool. Okay, that takes us to the end of the agenda and two open floor pull requests worthy of discussion. Does anybody else have anything they want to discuss? No? Okay. Um, we are at 745. So David, do we want to do a bug scrub this week when We did uh, almost 10 last week. I'm fine with skipping if everyone else says. Is there any uh, PR or bug that people would like to discuss? Yeah, I think. Uh, I think we're all set here and uh, we can return uh, 10 minutes to everybody. Everybody sound, everybody good with that? Yep. Sounds good. Okay. Well, have a good week, everyone. And uh, somebody just put my ear from Ow. Is that me? No. Ooh, okay. All right. Uh, we'll conclude this meeting then, and uh, we'll see you next week or uh, on, on uh, the mailing list or the Slack. Thank you. Have a good week. Thank you. Bye. 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 See you. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>